With some of the similarities that we've been seeing so far between the electric and the gravitational forces, it might seem natural to ask, can we construct potential energy functions for the electric force? And the answer to that is yes. But before we get into that, let's just start by just doing a quick bit of review about how we could use um, potential energy to solve a problem with gravity. So let's say you drop a ball. Um, let's say that it is from an initial height of 10 meters and we're going to go ahead and let it fall towards the ground. Um, and what we would like to know is just before we hit the, hit the ground, what is the final speed if we drop the ball from rest? So hopefully this is something that we remember, but let me just throw in a little wrinkle here um, just to help drive the analogy home. Remember, we're sitting in a uniform gravitational field. So let's just go ahead and draw in gravitational field lines. So these are not electric field lines here. Um, these are gravitational um, field lines. And we'll label them G. So again, at any point, it works the same way. At any point, we can find the gravitational field vector by finding the uh, vector that would be tangent to the field lines in the area. Okay, so with that added little wrinkle, it would still solve it the way that we had solved it before. You probably learned to do something like make a table where we write down all the forms of energy we can think of, both at the end of the process and initially. And at the moment, I can think of kinetic energy and gravitational, woo, gravitational potential energy, and, well, that's about it. So we know initially, since we dropped the ball from rest, the initial kinetic energy was zero. The final kinetic energy, we would write that as being one-half mv final squared. Now here, we know that the potential energy is mgy, so this would be mgy um, initial here. And here we would have mgy final, but y final we set to be zero. So then you just add up both columns, right? One half mv final squared equals mgy initial. And fortunately, the m's cancel, which is a good thing because I never gave you the mass. You get that the final um, velocity is going to be the square root of 2, or more the point, the final speed, and the square root of 2g, y initial. And then you can go ahead and put in your numbers if you want. Um, so you can say v final is the square root of 2 times 9.8. And I prefer writing gravitational field strengths as newtons per kilogram um, times 10 meters. Now here we will take advantage of the fact that a newton per kilogram is dimensionally a meter per second squared. So when we times a meter per second squared with a meter, I'll have meters squared per second squared. I'm taking the square root, so I get meters per second. And in fact, I get 14 of them. All right, so hopefully that uh, brought back some memories of doing energy analysis. So let's remember what the pros and cons are of doing energy analysis. The big plus is that it's easy to do. Um, we can always do anything using Newton's laws of motion, um, but sometimes the math for that can be a royal pain. But keep in mind the, there is the additional trade-off that we give up information about the path and time evolution. So what do I mean by that? Well, notice here all I could do was solve for the final speed. I did not solve for the final velocity, although physicists are usually pretty lazy about that. We had to resort to our common sense of knowing that the object is going to fall down 
to know that the direction of the final velocity was downward. That's called exploiting a constraint. But we couldn't just find the direction from the energy analysis in and of itself. We had to bring in something else. In this case, what we did was just a really super intuitive Newton's second law calculation without any numbers to get that direction. Um, similarly, by time evolution, what I mean by that is we have absolutely no idea how long this process took. If we need to know that information, we would have to resort to kinematics equations or other techniques, but energy analysis isn't going to give it to us. So, of course, the other caveat is that this only works if the forces are conservative, so the first natural question is, is the electric force conservative? So pause on that and get back with me. And the answer is yes, the electric force is conservative. Um, in a future video, we'll go ahead and dot the I's and cross the T's on that explicitly to show that it's conservative. But for now, it'll do just to remember that is to do a comparison with gravity. So we'll just start by putting in here that the electric force is conservative. And this is because the forces have the same um, mathematical form. So over here I'll put gravity. And over here I'll put the electric force. And so for our expression for the forces, um, gravity we said was g m1 m2 over r squared following Newton's law of universal gravitation. And remember, near the surface of the Earth, where the gravitational field strength is a constant, we can simplify that to mg. And the electric force has the same kind of mathematical form. So let me write fg and fe so we can keep them straight. And we'll go ahead and use k this time instead of 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, but whatever you prefer. q1, q2 over r squared. So there's a proportionality constant check. There are two charges, check, and there is an inverse square relationship for the force. So they're mathematically identical. So since in mechanics we showed that gravity is conservative, since the electric force has the exact same mathematical form, it's conservative as well. Um, so this means that we can go ahead and write down what the potential energies are. So we remember when we did this for gravity, we saw that the potential energy for gravity was minus g m1 m2 over r squared. Um, and this was with us setting um, the gravitational potential energy at infinite separation to zero. Um, and for the electric force, the gravitational, sorry, the electric potential energy is plus k q1, I'm sorry, not over r squared there, my bad, is plus k q1 q2 over r. And again, for the exact same reasons of calculus, we make the choice of setting the potential energy for infinite separation of charge to be zero. Now, something I do want you to notice here is that there is a difference in the explicit sign in front of the equation for the gravitational potential energy for gravity versus the electric force. So I want you to pause and ponder on is why is that? Okay, there's a couple ways that we can go about this. Um, I think a good place to start would be 
to just think about what the what the spontaneous behavior is. Remember, masses can only be positive, and with gravity, the spontaneous behavior for two masses is to get closer to each other. So if we get closer, the number in the denominator gets smaller. So since for spontaneous behavior, the potential energy needs to be lower, um, since I'm going to get a bigger number here, I need a minus sign in front in order to make it a lower value than when the separation was larger. On the other hand, for the electric force, let's work it out. If the two charges are the same sign, say both positive or both negative, Q1 times Q2 will be positive, and the spontaneous behavior is to fly, uh, to fly apart. So we want when R gets bigger for the potential energy to be lower, and that will indeed work with a plus sign. But if one charge is positive and the other is negative, then the spontaneous behavior would be to fly together, but then that all works out, and this because this is a negative number, so as R gets smaller, we'll have a bigger number with a minus sign, which means that we'll have a lower electric potential energy. So from the, um, be, from the notion of intuiting the behavior um, based on the spontaneous behavior of the objects, um, that, that's, that makes sense for the signs there. But I also just kind of set you up on one. Um, remember here, if I have two masses, um, so let me just draw them here, M1 and M2, um, they attract gravitationally. So, but keep in mind, R hat means away. So if we're thinking about this force here on FG, if I were to turn this into a vector, I would need to have a minus R hat in order to make them go towards each other. Whereas with the electric force, say if I have a positive charge and a positive charge, here they're going to want to repel. And as we saw here, if I'm modeling this charge, R hat points away from there. So I'm already good that this should be plus R hat. So when I turn into the, the forces into the vector form, then we can see that we've got minus signs both with the vector and the potential energy and with the electric force we have plus signs both with the vector and the potential energy. So either way you want to think about it is fine but just be aware that there is a difference in the sign. Okay so let's just start <coughs> by constructing a poten an electric potential energy function for the situation where we have a charge in an electric field. Oops, let's make our electric field positive, or sorry, red. So I'm just doing this in very much an analogy to what we did with the rock earlier. So let's just say for the sake of argument that we have a positive charge here. We'll revisit negative charges in a second. So let's say this is location A, or our initial location. And we're going to move it here to our final location. So this vector here would correspond to our displacement delta x or delta r. Now we can just use delta x, that's fine. So you think about it, that's exactly what's happening here. This object moved from here to there with the gravitational field. Here, this electric charge is moving from here to there parallel to the electric field. All right. So let's go ahead and calculate the change in the potential energy. So remember, by definition, the change in the potential energy will be equal to the negative of the work done by the electric force. So here, 
this is going to be um, minus the work done will be the force dotted with the displacement. So this will be the electric force dotted with my displacement delta x. And the electric force will be QE dotted with delta x. Now here I've got delta x going parallel to E, so the dot product is just going to be E delta x. All right, now let's check this if it were a minus sign. So here, just to make it explicit, the electric force points in the same direction as the displacement, so the work is positive. So the change in the potential energy is negative for a positive charge. Okay, let's just go and see if we have to do anything any different if I moved a negative charge. And again, I'm going to move it in exactly the same direction. So here, which way does the electric force point? Yeah, it points to the left, because remember, the electric force is Q times E. And so it's going to point to the left. So here, the, um, the, so here the work needs to be, po needs to be negative. Um, because the dot product of the force and the displacement will be negative which means the change in potential energy needs to be positive. But that's exactly what we'll get if we stick a minus sign, if we stick in a negative number for Q. I have this minus sign, then I'll have the negative number, gives me a positive number throughout. So for everything, it's minus QE delta X. Now in practice, if you just want to work by magnitude and take care of the plus and minus sign by hand, I'm certainly not going to tell you no. Now you might ask, what if I instead did something like, say, moved it like that, say our positive charge? Remember, when we were doing this for gravity, we showed that if the force is conservative, all I have to do is connect, is find any path that connects the two points. So let's do this path followed by that path. Oops. There we go. So we've already seen for this path, the change in potential energy would be minus QE delta X, because it's literally no different than what we did here. How much work would we have to do for this path? Pause and get back with me. Okay, so here, the work done, or the change in potential energy, um, is zero along this path. And that's because the work done along this path is zero. That's because the force is to the right, the displacement is down. So the force dot, so the product of the force, dot product of the force with the displacement, since they're at right angles, is zero. So, we wind up doing no work there. So all we need to do is just figure out the component we displaced along our uniform field. Um, and just use that. So if we assume our uniform field is directed along X, there you go. All right. So with that, let's just go ahead and do an example here. Let's say that I have my uniform electric field. Let me just draw a new one. Um, and let's say this uniform electric field has a strength of 1,000 Newtons per coulomb. Now we will go and place an object with a mass of one kilogram 
and a charge. Let's say it's one my one milli coulomb, which is kind of big, but not impossible. Um, and let's say that we let this go from rest, so V initial is zero. We know it's going to move off to the right. Let's say it moves delta x is one meter. Um, so let's say it moves a meter, um, ends up over here. We know it, in this case here, if it's plus one microcoulomb, again, we can intuit that since the force points to the right, the final velocity vector has to point to the right. Um, so let's go ahead and find the final speed. So again, we can do the same thing. Um, we can make a table, final, initial. So, and we can write down all the forms of energy we can think of, which will be kinetic and electric potential energy. So here we write one half mv final squared, one half mv initial squared, and v initial is zero. And here, since I gave you as for a change, um, changes are always final minus initial. So we could just go ahead and make the, um, the uh, final zero, which would make the initial QE delta X. If you prefer, you could make the initial zero and the final minus QE delta X. Um, either of those will work. And let's just go ahead and add up and equate. So 1 half mv final squared equals q e delta x. And so now when we do the algebra, we get that v final is equal to the square root of 2 q e delta x over m. Now notice something that happens here. The m doesn't cancel. That's why I had to give you a value this time. This is a, a new wrinkle. When we did this for gravity, um, because the potential, the kinetic energy expression had an m in it, and so did the potential. Here, this is that inertial mass, and this is that gravitational mass I've mentioned before, which in principle are different things, but to all of our best observation, they appear to be the same thing. Um, because of that, these m's cancel. But here, the, what sets the scale of the electric force is the electric charge, which is a different physical quantity than this inertial mass. So there's no cancellation at all, and so you're left with a charge to mass ratio. This will show up a lot when we're doing electric force problems. Okay, so we can go ahead and put in our numbers. Um, let's just do that down here. So we have V final is the square root of 2. We said that the charge was 1 millicoulomb, so we'll have to get that into coulombs, so 0 0.001 coulombs. The electric field strength was 1,000 newtons per coulomb. Our displacement was 1 meter, and our mass was 1 kilogram. So let's check our units again, make sure they work. Um, coulombs will cancel here. I'll be left with a newton times a meter. A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. In fact, let's just go and do the scorecard over here just to make sure we're all good on this. So we have coulombs times newtons per coulomb times meters over kilograms in the root. The coulombs will cancel. And then we have to remember that a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, which we're timesing by a meter, and then dividing by a kilogram, and then we're taking the square root of everything. So we have meters squared per second squared inside the square root is meters per second. So yes, the units do check, that's good. And when you run the numbers through on your calculator, or just do it in your head, you'll get that the final speed is 1.4 meters per second, 1.41 if you want to do it to three figures. Okay, so now let's revisit this problem. Let's say instead of this charge being plus a millicoulomb, it was minus one millicoulomb. How would the problem be different? 
pause and get back with me. Okay, the only difference is that it would be moving to the left. So I've displaced to the left a meter instead of to the right because the electric force would be pointing to the left. A negative charge times a rightward electric field will give us a leftward electric force. So the charge will be displacing to the left. So that means its final velocity points to the left, but the speed is exactly the same. Okay, in the next video, we're going to go ahead and figure out the potential energy function for two point charges. Um, so we'll go ahead and see you there.